Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today as the National Board of Public Health Examiners presents the second in our series of six webinars geared to explaining the domains, domain areas of public health and to help you prepare for the upcoming Certified in Public Health CPH examination. Each study session will be led by an expert faculty from ASPPH member schools and will focus on one of the five core areas of public health. Each session will be two and a half to three hours long and include a presentation, lecture, and interactive segments. A break will be offered midway through the presentation. This presentation will be recorded and archived on the MBPHE website one to two days afterwards. You may register for the remaining four sessions on the MBPHE website. Today's session feature is the cross-cutting areas of public health. Please feel free to key in your questions at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and we will answer questions at the end of the session. Um, we are pleased to have Donna Peterson, the Dean of the uh, University of at South Florida College of Public Health, per, to present to us on the cross-cutting areas. So thank you very much, Donna, and you can go ahead. Thanks, Kate, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, for the series. I hope you're participating in the entire series to help you prepare for the CPH exam um, or if you are just curious about public health and what, uh, what we consider foundational content, this is a great, uh, great way for you to, to learn about that. As a founding member, a proud founding member of the National Board, I'm very, very pleased to see so many of you here uh, and the interest that has been expressed in this exam and the number of people that have taken it and earned the certification continues to grow and that's of, that's of, uh, of great uh, excitement to us um, who put this together uh, really as a way to help uh, the field of public health become more professionalized. So thank you for your part in helping us to do that. So what we'll be doing um, probably for the next couple of hours, and Kate, I am, let me see if that'll work. There we go. Okay. Um, and I don't think we'll take more than two hours. That's my, that's my expectation. So. Um, we can get through this, I think, pretty quickly, is we will be discussing the cross-cutting items that are part of the exam. As Kate mentioned in her introduction, the exam is based primarily on the five core areas of public health, the traditional five core areas. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about how these cross-cutting domains came into being and, and why, and then we can dive into the kinds of items you might see on the exam, and then we'll end with a few sample questions, um, just again to give you a sense of how multiple choice questions in these areas might, might appear on the exam. So with that, we'll jump in. So the cross-cutting items represent 25 out of the total 200 items on the exam, which means that's 12.5% of the exam, so it's not a large content area, but it might make the difference in, uh, in, a, in a passing score. Um, and it's important information to know or we wouldn't have identified them and we wouldn't be including them on the, on the exam. They are not like the core disciplines in that traditionally in uh, schools and programs of public health, students and masters of public health programs and others, depending on the school or program, have taken classes in the five core areas. And there isn't typically a class in cross-cutting areas. Um, but this is content and knowledge and a set of skills that we believe are important to the professional practice of, of public health. And in some ways, they reflect the, the common knowledge of our field that um, you should know students pick up just by being in an academic environment, by being in a practice environment, by engaging with um, the media and, and communities, this is, this is, um, this is content that, that you should probably just know. So it's not um, necessarily uh, critical that there be a course on these things, but that you be aware as, again, potential takers of the exam that this is knowledge that we believe is important to professional practice and so areas that you would like to at least be, be aware of. So how did this happen? So when what was then the Association of Schools of Public Health, we are now of course the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, but when, when AFPH decided to, to go down this competency development path in the first place and the first set of competencies were developed in the early 2000s for the, for the MPH degree, um, how do you start developing competencies for a degree? Well, we sort of defaulted to what was then uh, the common core curriculum. We all 
because of the accreditation requirements, all of us were teaching content in those five core areas. And you know them well. And the, um, this particular uh, review session series is organized around those five core areas. And then this, of course, is the sixth. So those are the five core areas that we have known and loved. And so we organized competencies around those five areas, because that made sense. We assembled groups in epidemiology and in health policy and management and all the five areas and asked them to help uh, derive a set of competencies specific to those areas within the field of public health. But what happened when we did that, why am I not going to the next slide? Mm -hmm. Okay. But what happened when we did that, as you can imagine how these conversations took place, every group, and I mean every, identified things as they were deliberating competencies for their area, so competencies for biostatistics, competencies for environmental health. They identified things that they believed were important for the practice of public health and for an MPH student to know and to be able to do, but they didn't really fit under those five core areas. Things like communication, the ability to communicate effectively, the ability to lead, the ability to be culturally competent. Um, so they identified these things, but then each group said, well, we think that's important, but that's not biostatistics or that's not environmental health. So we developed these sort of parking lot lists of, of uh, competencies. And when we uh, looked at them, the totality of the package, we said, you know, those things are so meaningful and so important. We really need to reflect on those. And so from the original five work groups, we actually formed nine more around these other competency areas that was also reflective of an IOM report that had come out around that time that was suggesting different, different competency and content areas for MPH curricula. So we put these nine work groups together and they got to work on these what are now um, an additional set of cross-cutting competencies. The other thing that we, we realized was that none of the five individual groups um, was positioned or felt compelled to include in the competencies within their sets the ability to define and defend public health. So we also wrote a preamble to that competency report that said, you know, this general knowledge of, of what public health is and what the values are and what its fundamental principles are is also very important and should be reflected in a Master of Public Health training program. Oops, I went too fast. OK, so here's what that looks like. So we defined public health at that time. Um, we made clear that it is a profession, that it focuses on population and society's role in monitoring and achieving good health and quality of life. And then we identified a variety of, of places and areas of emphasis that public health professionals may, may engage in. And I share this one because you should see it and know that it was in that document. People tend to jump over the first page, so they might not know it's there, but it is there. And I was very gratified. I was actually in Tokyo, Japan this past fall. I was on a panel, and um, a, a speaker on the panel, there were three of us, one of the other speakers used this when he was defining public health. And, I, and he, he talked about how there are, there are um, lots of different ways that people define public health, but he actually liked this one best. And I was sitting there looking at it, and I thought, boy, that looks really familiar. And then I, I realized where it came from. So I was very pleased to see um, that it had, it had some, some life, which is great. So what the model ended up looking like, and if you go to the ASPH website, you can see this original competency model for the Master of Public Health degree, um, is that we have the five core areas, what had been the five core areas of public health, um, surrounding the set of uh, what we eventually came to is this set of cross-cutting competencies. And so the model is intended to reflect the inner relationships of all of these things in the professional practice of public health. And then this then informed the development of the content guide for the CPH exam, which was being uh, considered and developed around the same, the same time as this effort was underway. So I want to go through each of them um, just as they are described in that report, just to kind of frame your thinking around this. And um, I think, uh, well, I'll, I'll see how, how we do um, 
and when we need to take a break. But we'll we'll, we'll just dive in here. And as I'm as I'm talking, as Kate said, you can always type a question in the box, and we'll we'll answer them at the end. So the communications and informatics uh, competency area is defined as the ability to collect, manage, and organize data to produce information and meaning exchanged by the use of signs and symbols to gather, process, and present information to different audiences in person through information technologies or through uh, other uh, channels of the media to strategically design the information and knowledge exchange process to achieve specific objectives. So that's a mouthful. But that's the communications and inform informatics competency domain. And then in the report, you can actually read all of the competencies within that domain. And I will reflect those as I talk more later about the actual content guide for the exam. The next cross-cutting area, diversity and culture, defined as the ability to interact with both diverse individuals and communities to produce or impact an attended public health outcome. And there are a set of competencies under that definition, very important in the practice of public health. The next is the leadership competency area. Uh, very important. I actually like this, this definition best, if I may be allowed to editorialize. I think this one is just really, really well done. And I wasn't even on this committee, but I love this. The ability to create and communicate a shared vision for a changing future. I really like that. The ability to create and communicate a shared vision for a changing future. Leaders also have to be able to champion solutions to organizational and community challenges uh, and energize commitment to goals. And then there are a series of, again, discrete competencies within this domain, reflective of the leadership nature of our field and the importance of working at both the organizational level and the community level in exercising the leadership that we need for public health. The next one is um, the prof we are a public health profession, and so professionalism and ethics becomes very, very important. So professionalism is the next competency domain. This is defined as the ability to demonstrate ethical choices, values, and professional practices implicit in public health decisions. Also, the ability to consider the effect of choices on community stewardship, equity, social justice, and accountability where you see the things that are important, those foundational principles to public health. And also professionalism is about committing to personal and institutional growth and development. So you see here the idea of a profession, which one of the hallmarks of a profession is that we have the ability to engage in ongoing professional development, lifelong learning, and that we ascribe to an ethical code. So that gets reflected in this content domain, competency domain. The next is program planning. Again, very important in public health practice. The ability to plan for the design, development, implementation, and evaluation of strategies to improve individual and community health. I happened to be in Washington, D.C. last week and ran into an alumni of the College of Public Health here at the University of South Florida, an alumni from 2002. So he's been out in the work, in the work world for a long time and it had a very interesting career starting in the local health department and working his way up to the CDC and now he's working on some global initiatives around HIV and AIDS. And as we shared a taxi cab downtown, he said, please tell me you're teaching students how to plan and, and implement and evaluate programs. There's nothing more important. And I, I laughed because I said, yes, um, I think that was an important development in our thinking about competencies for the MPH. This is very, very important, and so this reflects that domain. And again, you can see that you will see, if you look at the report, the discrete competencies within this domain. The next is public health biology, and these are in no order other than alphabetical, so they're not in any particular order. Um, but the group that worked on this thought it was very important that Master of Public Health students understand the biological and molecular context of public health, and this reflects um, the desire to make sure that all students in public health programs and practicing professionals, a larger number of whom now do not come out of the biological sciences or with already earned clinical degrees. So if you think back on our history, uh, the MPH used to be earned primarily by people with prior clinical degrees. 
and there was a real shift in our thinking about that in around the 1980s. And so now, increasingly, in some cases, the majority of our students do not come with this background. So it's important in thinking about competency development within a curricula that there be sufficient um, content to enable students to understand the biological and the molecular context of public health. We could throw in the word genomic or genetic at this at this point, but I think I think you see what this means. And again, there are some competencies within that area. And then the last one is around uh, this, the importance of systems in public health. Um, you all know, I'm sure, on the phone how important it is that we recognize that public health uh, itself is a system, that it has to interrelate with other systems within the society, that we have to be thinking always about the interrelationships and the communication pathways and all the ways that uh, activities in one part of a system can impact other parts of the system. Um, this is something that I think we all understand intuitively, but it's very difficult to describe. And even if you look at how the group decided to define it, it sort of violates all the rules of how you would define something and that we put the term actually in the definition. You should remember this from English class way, way, way back. So we define systems thinking as the ability to recognize system level properties that result from dynamic interactions among systems, human and social systems, and how they affect the relationships among individuals, groups, organizations, communities, and environments. So again, trying to get at this notion that you know, public health is both you know, at the same time creating and supporting system approaches, but also exists within a system and has to manage system dynamics. So that's the last uh, cross-cutting competency domain that you will find in those MPH competencies and as a result also on the exam. So when we, so we agreed that, that these competency domains were going to form the basis of the original uh, CPH exam, and when we set about to craft an exam, we had to write items for the exam. And so we invited people uh, to join us, and we had lots of people step up and uh, offer to write items for this exam. Uh, we had quite a few, actually, early on. We still do. We're always looking for item writers, so I'll put that plug in now, that if you um, get through this successfully and uh, want to give back. We have a lot of people with the CPH exam now who step up and uh, offer to help write items for us. I would encourage you to think about that. But early on, as we were you know, crafting this exam, we encouraged item writers to say, okay, here's the competency set. Here they are. Here are the 12 domains. Five are the core. The others are this cross-cutting. Each one has a set of competencies within it. You know, we should be looking at those competencies to drive how we write items. But the reality in the world was that wasn't necessarily how content was being delivered in our schools and programs. As I said at the beginning, um, we, we really wanted to make sure that the exam reflected some common curricular elements across schools and programs. And that really was the five core areas. That was the one thing that was common. So we encouraged our item writers to certainly use these competencies to guide their writing of items, but also to think about in their environments or from their experience what was actually being taught in those core courses or whatever the core curriculum looked like at any given school or program. Um, because again, that's the common element, and we wanted the exam to be robust, of course, but we wanted it to be fair. And so the required core, the CEPH, Council on Education for Public Health, our accrediting body, that required core was the common element um, across our programs. However, as I note here, um, and it didn't, it shouldn't have surprised me like it did, but we don't always, <laughs> we don't always agree. In fact, we don't often agree. Um, even though we might agree, yes, I'm teaching an introductory epidemiology class, what's in that class, how far it goes, um, we don't all we don't all agree on, and uh, epidemiology and biostatistics you might think are perhaps the most straightforward. In some ways they are, but we didn't even agree there. We definitely had very different approaches as different schools and programs to the health policy and management content, depending on our faculty or the community that we that we lived in. 
um, that our schools and programs existed. And we had different ideas about environmental content. And so it made it challenging to try to identify common uh, knowledge elements that we would want everyone with the certification in public health to, to be able to, uh, to, to show us that they had by passing this exam. So I say all this, you know, both to give you some of the background, because I just think it's really interesting, but also to alleviate uh, perhaps some anxiety that you, that you might have. Multiple choice questions are actually very difficult to write. And what I think nearly all of us have learned going through this process of uh, being item writers and going through the process of reviewing items and, and making sure they're appropriate for the exam, it's a very, very intensive process and few of us are actually very, very good at this. Um, it's another reason why I would encourage you, uh, is particularly if you are teaching in any way um, and testing uh, students or trainees in any way, this is wonderful training on how to write good multiple choice questions because a lot of us really didn't know that, didn't know much about the sort of the science and the art of crafting multiple choice questions that are, that are good. So it's challenging. It's challenging when you don't always agree on what the content actually even is, and then it's challenging to write items that are that test what you want to test, that are fair, that aren't um, tricky. And we work very, very hard to not have tricky questions on this exam. We uh, made a decision long ago not to require you to do any uh, mathematical calculations. You'll hear this when you, if you sit through the Epi and the Biostat. Uh, areas for sure, um, because it's not a math test. It's, it, we, don't, we don't want to know that you can do the math to calculate the positive predictive value of a, of a screening test. We want to know that you understand how to put that together. What, what are the elements of a, of a table of a screening test that would enable you to calculate that? So those are things that, that you'll see on, on this exam. But particularly for these cross-cutting competency areas, just as you were reading the definitions and listening to me, if you were thinking at all about how on earth would they write a multiple choice question to test for that. If you had that thought, you're right. It's very, very challenging. Um, and so if you have a chance while you're sitting here or later on or sometime out with your friends, want to have some fun, try to write a multiple choice question on any of those, of those areas and think about how, how challenging that actually is. The way you write a good item is that you write a stem, so that's the actual body of the question, and it has to be a complete thought, or ideally a good question. It's a complete thought, so that an examinee could cover up all the answer options, read that stem, and conjure up an answer in their mind. So if you do crossword puzzles, that's not a great analogy, but you know sometimes you'll look at a clue, and before you even look to see how many letters there are, and if you have any letters, you know you think about what the what that might be. Same kind of thing. So a good multiple choice question doesn't say uh, which of the following is correct, and then have four statements because <laughs> you can't answer that without looking at the answer keys. You want the stem to be a complete thought that, per that someone can answer. So you read the question, you think in your head about what the answer might be. Then you look at the options, the answer options. They all have to be real. They have to be real things. They can't be made up things. And they have to be um, uh, close to something real. They have to be real things, but they also have to be a, a plausible answer to the question is what I'm trying to say. And so more than one option may, may apply but there's only one best answer. And you're looking for the best answer to that question. And when I say they have to be real things, so if we're asking you something about um, the uh, about OSHA, for example, and so we'll have OSHA as an option choice. We might have NIOSH as an option choice. We might have the uh, AFL-CIO is an option choice, then we can't make up you know, the workers' rights safety movement. We, we can't make something up as an option choice. So whatever option choice you see, they're all real, but again, there's only one best answer. And again, thinking about what we just talked about, systems thinking, leadership, professionalism, diversity, and culture, those are difficult things to 
kind of wrap your head around anyway, but writing multiple choice questions and then coming up with four plausible right answers is very, very challenging. So I really commend the people that have written items um, for the bank for this, for this content area. Um, but I say it to you um, to, again, hopefully alleviate some of your anxiety. These are going to be as straightforward as we, as we could write them, understanding that this is a challenging area to work, to work within. So again, we started with the, uh, the endorsed, adopted ASPH competencies for the MPH. That's how we began to develop our content guide for the exam. That let us categorize items as they were written. It allowed us to um, make assignments to the people who were writing items so we could show them, you know, we'd need this many items in epidemiology and specifically in infectious disease epidemiology or study design or, um, so it's helpful in that regard, helps us categorize items. And um, it's a work in progress. This is absolutely a learning organization and a, and a learning community. And so we've already modified the content guide four times since uh, 2008. And you should have access to the latest version. And you can look at, um, in those cross-cutting areas, what that content guide looks like. You can see the various areas. And we're going to take just a quick break. Uh, to, as I told you, we're not going to take two hours here today unless you have a lot of questions, which is fine. So we're going to go ahead and just take a quick 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and go through them, go through that content guide. I'll also be reviewing the general principles uh, category that we added to the content guide in the last version, which gets back to that preamble language that I shared with you because, again, we weren't, um, because it was in the preamble and not in the competency uh, document itself, it wasn't being reflected in the exam, and a group of us felt that it was very, very important that the exam test general knowledge about what is public health and what are its values and what are its fundamental principles. So I'll go over that as well. So we'll come back at 1.40 on my clock, and we'll pick up from there. So I'll be back in 10 minutes. Thanks.
Okay, we're back. Hope everybody's back. What we're going to do now is jump to. I'm not working again. Hang on. Da, 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 da. We just took a break. Here we go. All right. So diving into the general principles, as I mentioned, this was the category that we added um, in the last go round. And if you're looking at the content guide, or if you have looked at it, or you look at it later, you'll see that these are the areas under general principles. So. Um, how do we define certain terms in public health? What are the important sentinel events in our history that those of us uh, in the profession of public health should just be familiar with? Uh, what are the core functions and the 10 essential services of public health? Uh, public health agency accreditation, general knowledge about that. What are the values of our field? Um, responsibility for public health. At, um, you know, how does that happen? And then the U.S. public health system. And these things um, did not appear in other uh, domains prior to us adding this. So what might you see under this? Possible topics, given that outline. Uh, FAB is the uh, Public Health Accreditation Board, and people should know that that exists and how it functions. You should be able to define public health and the core functions of public health, articulate how the 10 essential services relate to the three core functions. There might be questions on that. What are the values, the core values of public health? You might see a question on that. And then the sources of authority for public health in the United States. The concept of police power. What, what is that? Where does it emanate from? And uh, of course, the 10th Amendment to the US Constitution is what uh, grants public health authority to states um, because it's one of the reserved powers in the Constitution. So that's, as I said earlier, a lot of this is just sort of stuff you should know just by living in the world, being in a public health environment, whether that's a practice environment, if you're taking this exam as a practitioner and not as a student. But as a student, these are things that you should be exposed to somewhere in your, in your curriculum. Other topics include um, the model that we use for public health, the, the ecological model, there's different variations on the theme, but um, you should understand in, in general what that's about. The notion of prevention as a core uh, foundational principle and approach in public health and what's the difference between a primary and a secondary and a tertiary level of, of prevention. Um, the life course perspective that we now uh, have embraced in our field where we understand that things that happen um, in your life uh, as you develop from uh, pre-delivery, pre pre-birth, through early infancy and childhood, through adolescence into adulthood, that everything that happens uh, impacts what happens next. And so that idea of a, of a true prevention model where we're really anticipating acro across the life course is a, is, a, is a new model that we think people with certification in public health ought to be familiar with. Uh, the health objectives for the nation. Um, the healthy people reports that uh, led to the original set of health objectives for the nation, how that's evolved, uh, where we are now, healthy people 2020, um, the general uh, outline of the objectives. We wouldn't expect you to know specific objectives, but just understanding the, the policy um, context in which those health objectives exist. And then related to that, how uh, the, fed, the federal government relates to the states. We know that public health responsibility and authority in the United States rests at the level of the state, but there's a huge investment at uh, the national level in the, in the various structures that exist and in the policy framework and in uh, the funds that flow. On the global side, the equivalent uh, parallel, if you will, to healthy people, healthy uh, national health objectives are the were the Millennium Development Goals, now we're into the Sustainable Development Goals, but again, understanding that kind of framework, that kind of policy framework that drives action, uh, you should be familiar with that. And then general knowledge about global health systems. So again, wouldn't expect specific knowledge about any particular nation's approach to health and health care, but we would expect some general understanding of the fact that each nation um, approaches uh, promoting and protecting the health of its populations in different ways based on their context and their history and their environment and their resources. And some understanding of different approaches that might be taken um, around the world would be, would be fair game under this um, particular domain content area on the exam. 
so under the what are the important sentinel events, historical events that as a practicing public health professional you just might want to be familiar with or you ought to be familiar with, um, things like John Snow and the famous uh, pump handle in, in, in Great Britain, um, the Jacobson versus Massachusetts court case which really established the idea of, of uh, police power of states being able to um, mandate compulsory vaccines uh, for smallpox in the interest of the public good. So Jacobson was an individual who objected to the Massachusetts Health Authority uh, requiring everyone to get a smallpox vaccine. And that case uh, was decided again in favor of in the public in the public interest for the public good. Um, it is sometimes uh, it, it is sometimes important and and uh, and appropriate for um, the state to step in and require something like like a vaccine. So that was an important precedent setting case. I skipped John Grant's bills of mortality. Those are the first time that someone actually attempted to uh, describe um, in a uh, in a methodical way what was causing people to, to die, what, what were the causes of death. And so again, that important precedent setting for the idea of how we collect data, we monitor data, we assess uh, what we've learned from that data, and then we, we act upon it. Um, and then there are other things, some of the major reports, the Surgeon General's report of 1964 on tobacco, the Levand report, which came out of Canada, um, which predated um, the, healthy, the first Healthy People report. Um, in setting an agenda that uh, shifted thinking um, in some ways toward a more chronic disease per approach as opposed to an infectious disease approach for public health, but also um, suggested, therefore, that health promotion activity should be part of the public health agenda. So again, a very important event, um, vaccines in general. And then you know the idea of all the various international treaties over the years um, that have been crafted and uh, signed on to by most countries to address fundamental issues important to the public's health, whether that be um, primary care or the rights of certain populations or climate change. Um, those treaties are important and it would behoove you to be familiar both with the idea of international treaties around human rights and health issues, but also maybe some of the some of the big ones like uh, Alma-Ata and Kyoto, for example. The 1915 Welsh Rose Report, if you don't know, is the report that laid out the blueprint for education in public health in, in the United States. Um, so again, a sentinel report, an important event in our, in our history. Um, so that's the general principles area. That's the kind of, of thing that might be covered in the exam. You might see questions. Remember how challenging it is to write multiple choice questions around these things. And remember that collectively, these eight areas uh, represent only 12.5% of the exam. But still, as a public health professional, these are things that you should just uh, be familiar with, be comfortable with, uh, be confident in your knowledge of. So now we move into the official cross-cutting uh, areas, communications and informatics. We defined it earlier. What kinds of things do you see on the content outline? You see things around the information infrastructure for public health, um, the various theories and the strategies then that emanate from those theories in both communication and informatics, um, the legal and ethical issues that arise when we're in the areas of communication and informatics, how do we use informatics to promote public health? Um, how do we use uh, these methods, uh, these approaches for advocacy? Um, how does the media relate to all of this? And risk communication is actually called out specifically because it's of critical importance in public health. And one of the areas that you know, we need to do very, very well, there are ethical concerns, there are risks. Uh, in poor, poorly done risk communication, so questions around those areas might appear on the exam. So what are some of the topics that might uh, appear on the exam? So all the data systems um, that exist to support public health. If we remember the first core function, there are three core functions of public health. The first one is, 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 is assessment. So how do we assess the systematic gathering of data and information to inform public health efforts? And we do that um, very, uh, very intensively. All the data systems that exist, all the vital record systems, the surveillance systems, whether they be at the national level, like the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, 
or at a state level, we may have a particular surveillance system around birth defects or cancer or you know, all those things, the surveys that are done, um, surveillance of reportable diseases, those systems. And then all the data that we gather just in the management of the programs that we provide, and these vary, of course, uh, state to state. Um, but there are some that are that are common, and if they aren't common, then the idea that there are program management databases out there is certainly a common idea. Um, qualitative methods to gather data is an important concept uh, under this under this topic, um, under this domain, um, and all the data that we're now amassing. Um, clinically for sure through the development and evolution of electronic health records systems and the data that exists um, in the consumer realm and in uh, various media you know all of this again not very not specific questions not tricky questions but just general knowledge of the fact that you know informatics being the sort of management and use of information is a huge part of what we do. And communications is a huge part of what, of what we do. And the data often drives the communications. Continuing under this domain, the role of the media, as I mentioned, um, that's both how does the media potentially impact public health, how do public health professionals work with the media, how are new forms of media, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter uh, changing the dynamic, the communication dynamic for public health. Um, but regardless of the form of media, uh, whether that's sort of big M media, the one we all love to hate these days, or just media in general, how do we how do we communicate? Regardless of the media being used, how we craft uh, the message um, in public health is very important, as I mentioned, particularly in risk communication. How we craft a message to elicit the kind of uh, behavioral response we want and not unintended behavioral responses. Um, in a risk situation, we don't want to induce panic. Uh, we don't want people uh, behaving in aberrant ways. We want them behaving in logical, rational, safe ways that will uh, protect their health and those of the people around them. And that raises ethical issues then in how we communicate and how do we do it honestly and openly um, and in ways that, again, encourage the kind of behavior that we want. Again, no specific questions, but general understanding of these concepts. You might find questions like that on the exam. The next cross-cutting domain area, diversity and culture, in the content outline, you'll see such things as how we define these terms uh, has its own history, how we define race, for instance, and uh, ethnicity is ever evolving our perceptions of what that means, how we collect uh, information on those things is changing right now. Um, we're looking uh, in databases to perhaps identify people from the Middle East in a different way. Um, right now, they tend to get categorized uh, often under, under Caucasian. Um, which they do not identify with necessarily, but there's controversies there. Um, maybe they don't want to be identified um, given current uh, prevailing perceptions. And so, the under, again, understanding that history is, is important. What is cultural competence? What is um, cultural awareness? What is cultural proficiency? Again, not specifics, but understanding the continuum of what it means to be culturally uh, competent, to use the, the term, um, in health care settings, in community settings, in public health research, in um, how we approach community public health challenges, how we communicate. A lot of these things are interrelated, so you know sometimes they, they spill over. Um, but again, these are important concepts. Um, health equity is a critical uh, part of, of public health and therefore how we achieve health equity and how we, how we um, discuss health disparities and how we analyze and, and uh, understand them becomes important here. In this category, you may find questions around how we create service systems that are uh, appropriate, that are available, are uh, easy to access, and are something that populations will accept. And we all know this from experience. You know, you design something without uh, the input of the eventual end user, and you will not get the usage that you might have expected. And that becomes important here, um, not only in the in the sort of 
narrow diversity uh, sphere, but in the in the larger in the larger uh, sphere. So um, being respectful and engaging respectfully, uh, engaging appropriately with communities, um, how we empower communities to adv advocate um, for their own needs, how we engage them in program planning. Community-based participatory research, that's CBPR, uh, again, an important um, part of the research portfolio for public health. And uh, public health professionals and practitioners often engage more in community-based research projects than they do perhaps in lab-based research projects or, or, or uh, research that's based in more narrow clinical areas. And so understanding community-based participatory research and the general concepts of it is important. What does it mean to engage the community? What does community-based really mean? Does it just mean I'm doing research in the community? No, it doesn't. It means that you've engaged the community in all aspects of the research project, and that's important. Um, understanding, again, as I was mentioning before, about if we're designing service systems, we had best design them with the full input and engagement of the audience. But we also have to understand the cultures of the different communities that we work with and how those different cultural practices or beliefs um, actually influence people's health behaviors. And there may well be uh, questions even particularly on how different cultural practices and beliefs may influence how people utilize health services and how they follow up on the recommendations from those from those health services. And again, the goal here is to recognize that we, we need to design service interventions or program interventions with the needs of the ultimate end user in mind. Um, questions about uh, um, justice at the level of the environment, uh, notions of environmental justice and how that relates to um, communities' level of empowerment and, and environmental equity, uh, environmental impact statements, um, those kinds of things. So there might be questions on here that ask you to um, sort of review a scenario where someone wants to build a hazardous waste site near a low-income neighborhood and why that might be OK or not OK and what some of the issues that might be entailed there. So you might see questions like that. So topics, what are the topics that might uh, appear here? I've already alluded to some of these, how we define race and ethnicity in the data collection systems that we rely on, notions of race as a construct. Is it biological? Is it, is it a social construct? Is it a political construct? So I talked about cultural competence. I talked about engaging stakeholders. I talked about community-based participatory research. Uh, clearly, the whole idea of determinants of health being social and cultural and environmental and political, as well as biological and, and genetic, um, is very, very important here and, and really uh, emphasizes why um, this area is so important to our understanding of health disparities and health equity and how these social and cultural determinants of health may, in fact, uh, provide greater avenues for health improvement than perhaps some more traditional clinical approaches. So, questions on those kind of topics might appear here. Under uh, the leadership domain, again, we went over the definition, and there are competencies in that document. And then they, those competencies are reflected to some extent here in what's in the content outline. So what are the attributes of leadership, the different leadership theories, principles of leadership? Um, you'll see here, and you might have expected to see it under program planning, and we might see it again. but you know, being able to articulate um, the, 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 the future-oriented vision, the mission of an organization or a program, the values, goals, and objectives. Yes, those are part of program planning, but they're also part of the leader's role moving an agenda forward. If you can't create and communicate a vision for a changing future, the way we define leadership, it will be challenging for you to, um, to lead in, in an effective way. And so you might see things related to that in this, in this domain. You see communication show up here. Again, again, there's a whole domain around communication. But in leadership, um, being able to effectively communicate is often the, a critical element in leadership success. Um, leaders need to listen. Um, and they need to be able to respond effectively. 
clearly um, there's management issues that are embedded within leadership, even though they technically are not the same things. And we would we would hope that our examinees would be able to recognize the distinction between leadership functions and management functions. Clearly, problem solving and conflict, uh, the ability to resolve conflicts, are uh, skills needed by both managers and leaders. Um, but sometimes in different arenas. Um, team building, of course, is a critical leadership function. And then we talked about engaging stakeholders under diversity and culture. But it's also, uh, it's also important here because it's part of how leaders uh, effectively build um, support for their agenda. So there might be questions here on how we build coalitions of stakeholders, interested stakeholders, to advance an agenda. You'll see, again, the values of public health. Um, both the health equity, social justice, human right, all of those things, they showed up earlier under general principles, but they show up here under leadership because leadership in public health is exercised within, um, within that context. And then the role of a leader as an advocate and how we uh, create advocacy opportunities at the organization and the community level is under this content area. What are some of the topics within that? content outline. We talked about leadership theories. Um, the most well-known um, is the management theory X versus management theory Y. And you may well see a question on the distinction between those two. I mentioned the management versus leadership roles. Um, important to understand, um, again, conflict resolution and problem solving, but also just how you manage a human resource, again, as a manager or as a leader, is very important in, in public health. I, the alumni that I shared a cab with, part of his passion for please tell me your teaching program planning and management was, you know, are we really teaching how to manage all of the resources that need to be appropriately managed to affect change through public health approaches? And that's, that's absolutely true. And so you might see questions relating to that under this domain. Again, we talked about how you engage stakeholders and build coalitions. And then the basic planning model here, um, but particularly for leadership, having the vision, having being able to create and communicate a shared, a shared vision. And again, we're starting to get into, we're already into, but this one in particular, very challenging to write multiple choice questions in this particular area. Uh, professionalism and ethics, the next area, what's in the content outline, principles of ethics and professionalism, um, the, all, the whole area of how we protect people in research um, projects, um, uh, the rights of, um, of research um, participants, very important under this. Uh, Evidence-based planning and evaluation comes under, again, it'll show up again in program planning and evaluation, but it's also here because it's part of how we practice as, um, as professionals who adhere to a code of conduct and who uh, live um, the, the principles of our field. And one of the values of our field is that we, we act on an evidence base and we contribute to the growth of an evidence base. It's part of our, of our profession. So that's why it shows up here. I mentioned managing resources, uh, managing human resources gets called out particularly under leadership, but managing financial resources and fiduciary responsibilities, um, being a steward of the public's trust, that's all part of, of ethics and operating professionally, and so you may see questions like that under this area. Um, often the ethical challenges we face are around um, the Jacobson versus Massachusetts court case. How do we balance the needs of a community or a population with perhaps the desires and concerns of the individuals within that population. And that's often where some of our, our biggest ethical challenges appear. And then again, um, in this area, understanding the legal environment that we work in, um, all of, all of uh, the regulations that are pursuant to laws um, we live in a heavily, or, or the environment we work in is a heavily um, controlled environment, lots of regulations, lots of laws, and how do those impact our ability to, to conduct the research and engage in practice that we need to, and that uh, emanates from laws that are enacted and, and then the regulations that follow at, at the national level. 
um, but also at the state level, and sometimes within our within our own institutions, and our own institutions and our own communities reflect the values of the of the societies and communities that we are in, and so understanding all of that and, and how it impacts what we do is important. So the kinds of topics you might see here, the kinds of questions you might see the basic ethical principles of beneficence and non-maleficence and justice and autonomy and utility and respect. Um, those basic ethical principles, there are, um, there are definitely questions on those areas because it's important that we recognize how those basic principles apply in public health practice and research, how we protect uh, people who are engaged in research, um, IRBs, the, and the origin of why we have institutional review boards, the Belmont Report, um, Nuremberg, Tuskegee, there are um, questions to conspect questions on those on those topical areas in addition to the other areas of professional professionalism that I mentioned. But again, just going back here, you can imagine it's a whole lot easier to write a multiple choice question about the Belmont report than it is about um, how you manage uh, your um, responsibilities as a uh, as in the in the financial fiduciary realm. Program planning and evaluation, uh, we discussed this, uh, this already, an important part of the competency um, domains and an important part of the exam. You'll see in the content outline things like needs assessment involving stakeholders uh, along the entire planning process and continuum, the notion of what it means to be faithful or to maintain, <laughs> maintain fidelity to a program design. That's about how we apply the evidence base to our own um, either institutional or community environment. If you are implementing an evidence-based practice, the more faithful you are to the original design, the more likely you are to, um, to garner the same results. However, the reality is that that's not always possible, and so understanding the difference there. You might see a question on that. How we um, develop and consider different strategies to address different challenges. Um, you will likely see questions um, on the different levels of prevention. I mentioned that earlier. It shows up in general principles, but it shows up again here because when we're uh, doing our needs assessment and gathering data and understanding what the challenges are in our communities and our populations, when we think about different approaches, we often think along a prevention continuum, the ecological model, a life course continuum. Those are the those are how we think about potential strategies. So you might see that here. I mentioned the, the vision, mission, goals, and values showed up in leadership. They show up again here, of course, because this is how we plan programs and design evaluation strategies um, by setting objectives that we can then develop um, the metrics around that enable us to monitor our achievement of our intended goals within the priorities that we have selected. How we develop either program or policy approaches depending on the issue, how we develop the resources and the, the justification for what we believe we need. Um, it's easier to write multiple choice questions around evaluation methods and design, so you might see some good questions there. So understanding the different um, process evaluation versus outcome evaluation and the different um, you know, observational and historical controls and randomized controlled trials. I mean, those are all evaluation um, designs that we would expect general familiarity with. Again, not a lot of specificity. Going back to community-based participatory research as a set of principles, um, that is a great model for how we communicate evaluation results. It's one of a number of them. But again, in public health, and this gets back to professionalism and ethics, we need to be sharing the results of our data efforts, whether it's our assessment efforts or our evaluation efforts, whether they are positive or not. And that gets back to communication. So you can see how some of these things interrelate. And then there are other ways to measure effectiveness, including uh, cost effectiveness of our efforts. Um, and again, there are, there are um, process and there are outputs, there's intermediate, short-term, intermediate, and long-term, and then your ultimate outcome, and cost efficiency, and political effectiveness, and all of those things are, are part of this. So you might see um, questions, again, on these topics within that outline. Fidelity to program design, I already mentioned that. 
um, putting together um, the budget, um, critical skill area for us. So you might see questions on that. Questions on different planning models that um, people use. Pre-seed, proceed, of course, is the sort of the granddaddy of all planning models in public health. Um, not a lot of detailed questions, but um, you should be sufficiently familiar with the model and with some of the key components of the model. For instance, um, as part of PRECI, there are a variety of, of diagnoses steps, and it involves um, looking sort of holistically at a community and then doing the the um, epidemiologic diagnosis where you gather data and then you do a deeper dive into the behavioral environmental diagnoses where you consider, I'm sure you've heard these terms, the enabling, predisposing, and reinforcing factors that relate to that particular issue that's, uh, that's being addressed and so on and so forth. MAP is the National Association of City and County Health Officials Planning Model. Um, derived from pre-seed, proceed, uh, supported by the Centers for Disease Control, and there are other um, there are other models out there. Ask though, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials uses I think something called Patch, and there's Apex, and but again, you don't need to know every one of them. Just basic understanding of how planning models work, and then within planning models, as I said, we need a vision, we need mission, we need goals, but then ultimately we need objectives that communicate to our partners in the world and, and guide our own work in what is it we're actually trying to do. And there are process and output and outcome objectives. There are short and long-term objectives. But we hope they're all written as SMART objectives. And that's an acronym that stands for specific, um, something we, uh, there's a metric that we can actually analyze. They are appropriate. They are. I forget what R is, T is timely, but anyway, you want to really think about objectives being very focused, very discreet, and very uh, directive. So, you know, we want to reduce smoking during pregnancy by 20% in this population of women between the ages of 18 and 38 that come to this particular clinic, and we want to do that in the next two years. So again, that concept is important. I already, measured, I already mentioned um, cost effectiveness is one way that we look at effectiveness. And also, what do we gain for the cost that we, that we spend? The different kinds of evaluations may show up here. Biology, second to the last uh, domain here. What is in the content outline? Things like um, susceptibility, host susceptibility, host agent. Um, the other one. <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, genetic factors, immunologic response, as I mentioned before, basic biological and molecular context within which public health works. Genomics, some questions on that. Um, pathogenesis, pathogenesis um, severity, you know, all those things around disease. And most of disease transmission, there's vector-borne, there's food-borne, there's airborne. And again, not a lot of very um, arcane material, but general knowledge, the difference between a virus and a bacteria, why antibiotic resistance is a problem. Um, basic, um, you know, the, the idea, the notion that there are different breeds of mosquito that carry different diseases, how diseases cross global borders, um, those kinds of things. So typical agents for disease transmission. You should know your basic infectious disease agents, Salmonella, E. coli, Staph, MRSA, you know, uh, Ebola. You just should be familiar with these things, the, the characteristics of those agents. Basic immunology, basic immunology, um, host susceptibility, um, things about vaccines, things about different treatments. So that's the kind of topics that might appear under biology. And then last, systems thinking where, again, you can look at the content outline. What are the characteristics of a system? Basic systems theory. How do we measure the impacts of system changes? Um, globalization shows up here. So what are the, and we talked about global health systems under general principles. Here it appears again in the form of what are the effects of globalization as a system um, input, if you will, on human health. It affects disease transmission. Um, through person-to-person -person contact, travel, the movement of goods, 
uh, particularly food um, and other products that might not be manufactured the same way in one country and get delivered to a, a different country. There may be different host susceptibility in a country. That notion, again, in biology, but it shows up again in systems. Um, various determinants of health status and then how does public health as its own system relate to other public systems, be that education systems, transportation systems, um, uh, social service systems, criminal justice system, housing, um, jobs, commerce, insurance, all of those things are important for us to understand. So topics under this, um, system, basic system theory about stocks and flows and the feedback loops that enable systems to the interrelated component parts of systems to communicate, characteristics of systems, um, again, how interagency, intersectoral efforts take place in public health. Um, again, general, general knowledge about this. Complexity theory is in the content outline. I don't know that I've actually seen a question written on that. Um, the system nature of populations in public health, again, gets a little, um, it's a little uh, cerebral here, you know. As I said, trying to trying to define this is challenging enough. Trying to write multiple choice questions on this is particularly hard. Determinants of health show up here again. Uh, we saw them. Um, we saw them under general principles. We saw them under diversity and culture. I think we saw them under leadership. They show up here again, and then again, globalization, migration, trade. Those are system um, impact factors that we might see questions on in this particular area. So we're going to take a moment now and actually look at some sample questions. Kate tells me that you can't, I don't know, you can't actually read them. I can read them. Can they not read them? Yeah, so I can read off the question and then um, once the poll comes up it cuts off a little bit, but you should be able to tell which is the answer. Um, but I'll go ahead with this section if you want, Donna. Okay, so if I can just sort of we're going to have, I forget how many there are here. There's just a couple sample questions. So, um, and again, I tried to, I tried to pick questions, um, and these are questions that aren't necessarily on any exam, but are examples of multiple choice questions written the way we like to see them. So you could cover up the, the answer options here and, and probably answer this question. And then there are four alternatives, all of which are real, uh, real organizations and are perhaps plausible responses to this, this question. So with that in mind, Kate, go ahead and Okay. Read the, the foundational definition of health still used today was written by which organization the following, uh, following the end of the Second World War? The American Public Health Association, the Institute of Medicine, the World Health Organization, or the Medical, American Medical Association? And I'm going to launch the poll. So please go ahead and select your answer. Okay, and it looks like, yay, that's have, the right answer. <laughs> yeah. So that's Great. the right answer, the, the definition that, um, that is sort of, many of us view as the foundational definition of health, a uh, complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity was written um, at the formation of the World Health Organization, which was formed as part of the United Nations after the Second World War. Um, the American Public Health Association, of course, defines public health. The Institute of Medicine has defined public health in different reports, but all of those emanate from that foundational uh, way of defining public health that the WHO um, came up with a long time ago, 1945 or something. It's pretty old, so good. Okay, the next question is, in the United States, which level of government bears responsibility for public health, federal, regional, state, or local? And I'll launch the poll. One second. Okay, go ahead and choose. Okay. All right, good. So, um, 59% of you either knew this already or were listening to me when I talked about this before. In the United States, states are the level that is actually uh, has the authority and the responsibility for public health. Um, I'm not going to tell you why because there's another question that relates to this, but there is a huge role for the feds. Uh, there's a huge infrastructure 
to the Department of Health and Human Services and other agencies. A lot of the funding for public health flows from the feds. But um, per our Constitution and uh, per um, case, a uh, whole body of case law, states, in fact, are the level um, that bears responsibility for public health in the United States. That's not true of most other countries. In most other countries, it's um, a ministry of health at the level of the, of the nation. OK. The next question is, which US Surgeon General issued the landmark 1964 report? And you'll see your options here. And let me go ahead and share the question. You can go ahead and make your choices now. OK. So the answer is actually D. Um, and the 64 report was the famous report on uh, tobacco, on smoking. Um, and it was Surgeon General Terry who uh, took the bold initiative to form the panel that actually uh, reviewed all the evidence to date, beginning in a, a study in 1912 on the uh, potential harmful effects of tobacco. And that is um, that was a landmark report. It was um, and worth taking a look at. Um, uh, David Satcher, well, uh, Joe Califano, C. Everett Coop, and David Satcher all were Surgeon General, so they're all real people. Um, but just uh, time-wise, um, they all were post-1964. Uh, Joe Califano um, worked for President Carter. C. Everett Coop worked for um, the Reagan administration. And um, uh, Clinton, I think, appointed um, the third. So even just Time-wise, um, Surgeon General Terry is the only the only option. <laughs> so you must all be young on, the, on this call. Um, that and that question. Now that I look at it, um, that's not a great stem. It should have said the landmark uh, report on tobacco might have been a more helpful stem. Though, um, if you know your Sentinel events, '64 uh, was the year of the of the tobacco report. Okay. The Sentinel Report, uh, The Future of Public Health by the Institute of Medicine was published in what year? 1965, 1988, 1999, or 2003? You can choose now. OK. Good. Uh, 1988 is the correct answer, and very, very important report. I believe it was the first time the IOM had written a report on public health, and it was a scathing review of the state of public health uh, in the United States. And it really um, galvanized the entire, not just the public health community, but uh, even a larger community of public health and health policy and health care and academic folks to really come together and address um, the very um, kind of hard to read observations that they made of the public health system. And a lot of what we have seen since then is a, is a result of that report. So it's a very, very important report. Um, and again, it was in 1988 that uh, the first Institute of Medicine report um, to really tackle this issue. They've written others since. There was another very important one in 2003 um, on, called Who Will Keep the Public Healthy, which was a follow-up to the future of public health. But this one was written in 1988. OK. The next question is, the United States city and county health departments were initially created to respond to what public health threat, infectious diseases, environmental exposures, maternal morality, mortality, uh, or unsafe work sites? And I will launch the question now. OK, go ahead. Okay. Excellent. Yes, infectious diseases. So the earliest um, health departments in the United States were um, largely developed in port cities. And the challenge was as uh, trade increased and more and more ships were coming into ports, bringing in important goods and services and people, they also brought, brought diseases. And so um, some authority had to be established to monitor what was coming in and 
perhaps uh, forced quarantines where uh, the, the people on the ship were kept out there for a number of weeks to make sure they were disease free when they came when they came in, into port. So yes, that is the correct answer. Okay. The next question is, Sean Snow is considered important in the evolution of public health for which of the following reasons? He developed the first successful human vaccine for smallpox. He introduced the idea of prevention by publishing bills of mortality. He used data to determine the source of chloria outbreak, and he, or he can, uh, created the first um, health department in the U.S. in Baltimore, Maryland. And I'll launch the question now. Go ahead and key in your answer. Okay. Great. So you either knew that or you were listening to me. So John Snow and the famous cholera outbreak in London, and he figured out that it was the I'm not going to remember. There were two, three water companies supplying water, and he used um, he collected. Um, information on where people were getting sick and where did they live and and what else were they doing and he used that data to identify the Broad Street pump as the source he didn't know what cholera was uh, it hadn't been identified yet that happened later but it was the first time that someone used um, information data maps um, to pinpoint the source of a, of a disease outbreak and by removing the handle from the pump there's actually a pub near Broad Street in London today called the John Snow Pub. You can go there and see the famous pump handle. He just went and on his own took the handle off the pump so that no one could get the water out of there and he effectively curbed the, curbed the outbreak. So he's considered uh, the father of epidemiology and that's why he is so revered and I'm sure they serve good beer at the pub so that's probably important <laughs> too, but yes. Uh, but it, this is a good example of a question where the options are all real things. There was someone who developed a successful human vaccine for smallpox. There was someone who published bills of mortality. We already talked about that, John Grant. And the first health department in the United States was, in fact, in Maryland, in uh, the port city. So those are all real things. OK. The next question is, uh, which of the following function or program is most likely to appear in every state health department in the United States? water fluoridation, vital statistics, mental health, or environmental regulation. Okay. Go ahead and answer. Okay. Oops. Um. That's correct. So every state manages um, the vital records function of public health, vital statistics, the collection of data on births and deaths and adoptions and divorces and marriages and all those things that uh, chronicle life events um, through a partnership with, uh, with the National Center for Health Statistics. And, and this goes way back to that early years of when health departments were established. Um, a lot of health departments were created late in the sort of a wave of, of you know, we started with um, city health departments near ports and then we started developing county health departments to deal with different infectious diseases and then several states uh, put in place state authorities. And then it was because of um, some funding made available to support the development of maternal and child health responsibilities within each state that actually led a number of states to form state health departments. They didn't have them, but they, they wanted the funding. And one of the things that the group that uh, created that mechanism was a huge advocate of was the recording of every of every birth and every death. And so the vital record functions were um, early um, parts of state health department statutes. It's often fun to go back and read the earliest um, um, the, the 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 original statute that created state health departments. We'll talk about nuisance control and infectious disease control, and we'll often talk about about the vital records system. So yes, uh, every state has that function. Uh, the other three vary uh, pretty dramatically, actually, across the country. Uh, because states, because the responsibility and authority rests with states, states decide how to organize their health authority and their, their public health uh, response capability. Um, and so they choose what they will have at all. So they might not have uh, 
a fluoride <clears throat> water fluoridation program at all. Um, or they may choose where to put certain functions, so where um, uh, environmental regulation and environmental health programs used to always be in health departments. A lot of them have been moved out into mega umbrella environmental agencies. Um, so it really varies state state by state. So a question like this is getting at a couple of things. One, that you understand that every state has responsibility for, for um, birth and death certificates, vital statistics, but also that they vary enormously depending on the state. Okay. All right, the next question is, authority for state public health police power is derived from which of the following, the Bill of Rights, an Act of Congress, the Tenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, or a decision of the Supreme Court? And you can key in your answers now. Okay. Yes. So again, you knew that or you're paying attention. Um, it is the Tenth Amendment that uh, spells out the powers that are reserved to the states um, or by not saying uh, what powers um, belong to the feds, everything else is reserved to the states and health is one of those powers reserved to the states. And that's where we derive police power. Um, the Jacobson versus Massachusetts um, case uh, confirmed the police power of the states, but it did not. It did not create that. So, this is good. Good answer. The following health equity refers to which of the following? The part of the Affordable Care Act um, that ensures every person receives the same essential health benefits regardless of pre-existing conditions. The notion that every person is born with the same level of health and it should and should practice personal responsibility to maintain it, the idea of partial, partiality in payments to all providers and institutions serving the health needs of, the of a community, social justice in health and the commitment to eliminate disparities in health and its determinants, including social determinants. And you can make your choice now. Yes. So, um, and this is one where you see health equity, you see the term health equity, you would start thinking about, well, what does that mean? And then as you read these answer options, you could pretty quickly eliminate, um, you know, B and C are pretty clearly wrong. Um, B might be right if you hadn't thought about it enough, but the answer is, is clearly C. Um, I put this one in here because it's got some longer uh, answer options, so some are quick reads, you can quickly look at the answers and, and consider them, but some have these longer answer options, and again, that's back to how challenging it is to write multiple choice questions for a lot of these, a lot of these areas, and I think there's only one more question left. Yes. Okay. Um, as a public health professional, what is the best way to view leadership? Leadership is about the person in charge, the person at the top. We just need to follow. Leadership suggests visibility, and we are more effective if we work out of the spotlight. Leadership is necessary to achieve goals, and we should seek opportunities to provide it. Leadership is prohibited among employees in the government sector. And you can make your choice now. Yes, of course. And again, I put this here to show you how hard it is to write questions <laughs> in these areas. So if you were really worried about this, if you were coming in and saying, oh, these cross-cutting areas and this is not fair and how, when do they ever learn these things, a lot of it is, is common knowledge, a lot of it is common sense. So you would read this and say, well, no, that's not even appropriate. And I want to reiterate, these are not questions from the exam. These are just sort of general multiple choice uh, questions just to give you a sense of what might get covered in this area and how it might how it might appear on the exam. So let's see, Kate, if you can can I get to the next slide. So again to wrap up, and I appreciate the time you spent with me today. I told you we'd be done early and we are. Um, the cross cutting areas, 
only 25 questions out of the 200. That's only 12.5% of the exam. However, that can make a difference. So you are uh, working toward a passing score. So you want to, every point counts, so you want to do well. Um, there's a lot of overlap. As you heard me say, it's not always clear what content area this question is coming from. I should tell you, if you haven't heard this already, the exam is not organized such that the first 25 questions are biostat questions and the next 25 questions are epidemiology questions. It's a random assortment of questions. So I wouldn't worry too much. I mean, I don't think you should worry about it at all, quite frankly, when you're reading a question and say, oh gosh, I wonder what domain that's out of. It really doesn't matter. It matters to us in how we categorize items and how we, how we score. But to you, um, it's just, you know, what is this question asking and can I choose the best answer from those presented to me? There is an opportunity uh, while you're taking the exam actually to make comments. So if you find a question um, uh, you can't possibly discern an answer, you think it's poorly written, you think the answer has been keyed wrong, or, um, you, can, you can make those comments. We do review all of them. We review all of the comments. And ex uh, items um, can be retired if we, as, as it turns out, despite our best efforts, you highlight for us that it's a bad item, we can retire it. Um, items that don't perform well, meaning everybody gets them right. That's not a good item. You might think it's a great item, but in terms of exam discrimination, it's not a good item. So we can retire an item. Or uh, uh, items that, um, that everybody gets wrong or that um, higher test scorers get wrong. I mean, we, we literally look at nearly every item multiple times. We look at it when it's written. We vet it. We rewrite it. We clean it up. It goes in the bank. We use it. We vet it again. We review it. Um, and again, we, you know, it's it's a process. It's a it's a very intense process. As I mentioned, items they're hard to write anyway, but they're particularly hard in some of these areas here, and we work very hard to make them not tricky. Um, so read them carefully. Read the read the question carefully. Read the answer options carefully. You know, the obvious answer might jump out to you. And you might be right, but an obvious answer might jump out to you. and You might be wrong. So don't get to item C and say that's the answer and don't read item B or item D I'm sorry um, really re really take the time um, one of the rules of good multiple choice question writing is there is never a question on this exam that says all of the following but which one or everything you know wh which of the following is not related to this particular you will not see those questions on this on this exam and for us again these are difficult questions to write um, it's a whole lot easier to say, you know, which of the following is not part of the precede planning model? Which of the following is not included in the ecological model? Those are a whole lot easier, right? It's a lot harder to say which one is and come up with four plausible options um, when only when only one is right. So again, um, I share that as as hopefully a a comfort. And again, as I said, a lot of this is common knowledge. A lot of it is common sense. If you're worried, I never took a class in these things. We aren't worried. Um, examinees actually tend to perform pretty well in this area. I think just uh, being aware of what's going on in the public health world around you, uh, if you're in practice with your colleagues just living through public health, or if you're a student talking to your fellow students, going to the lectures that are provided by practitioners, engaging in community-based work, this stuff will, um, you will learn it just by being part of that, of that community. Um, remember, we're testing basic core knowledge from the five core areas and again from these uh, cross-cutting areas. Um, do go back to your books and your notes from your core classes. Consider your general knowledge of public health. And we really encourage, to the extent that you can, sitting through these programs are certainly useful. There are other uh, study review opportunities you should take advantage of. But to the extent that you have friends, colleagues that are taking the exam with you, working together, to study together, to quiz each other. Um, we happen to love flashcards here in this college. Um, when it's exam time, we uh, tape flashcards all over the building where you can read a question and contemplate what the answer is and flip it over and uh, see what the, what the correct answer is. So we really create a, a, a learning community that's, that's working together and preparing together for the exam. And again, I like to think the exam is a means to an end, and the end is we want to create a more professionalized field and having people out there with the certification in public health helps us do that. So 
you taking this exam, successfully passing this exam, it's good for you, it's good for your career, but it's very, very important for our field. And the preparation you will do for the exam, I think, just helps reinforce important concepts, important theories, values, uh, general knowledge that helps you be a fully participating member of this profession and both a competent and confident uh, advocate for, for public health. So with that, I thank you very much. And I am happy to answer any questions that you might have on this. And sure, let me see if there are any questions. Thanks, Kate. No problem. Um, is there a book that you could recommend to prepare for the CPH exam besides the, no, the um, textbooks and the ASPPH study guide? Do you know of any resources? Um, right now, those are your best resources, are the basic core textbooks and then the, uh, the, the guide that's put together by ASPPH. There are sample, there's a sample, uh, what, what, that's not the word I want, a practice test that's on the web page. Uh, people find that useful, but no, there really is no other resource right now. Uh, APHA is actually putting one together now. Um, but no, right now, that's, that's what's out there. Uh, we, we think they're pretty good. People that use them say they find them helpful. Great. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I will be sending around this presentation to everyone that registered. Um, and um, Donna, I'm going to put your email on that in case anyone has specific questions, if you don't mind. Um, Absolutely. Anytime. Great. Um, so thank you for joining us today as the National Board of Public Health Examiners presented on the second of our series of six webinars geared towards explaining the domain areas and the upcoming uh, to help you prepare for the upcoming CPH examination. As I said earlier, these webinars are going to be placed on our website for future viewing, and you'll also receive an email with a link to the YouTube um, probably in a day. Um, so any questions can be sent to info at nbphe.org. Um, and again, thank you very much. Thank you, Donna, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your uh, afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kate, and good luck. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.